Luke 7 today. Luke 7, verses 1 through 17. After he had finished all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. Now a centurion had a servant who was sick to the, and at the point of death, who was highly valued by him. And when the centurion heard about Jesus, he sent to him the elders of the Jews, asking him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they pleaded with him earnestly, saying, He is worthy. You have to do this for him, for he loves our nation, and he is the one who built us our synagogue. And Jesus went with them. And when he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore, I did not present, uh, sorry, I did not presume to come to you, but say the word and my servant will be healed. Let my servant be healed. For I too am a man set under authority with soldiers under me, and I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does that. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him, and turning to the crowd that followed him, said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. And when those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the servant well. And soon afterward, he went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a great crowd went with him. And as he drew near to the gate of the town, behold, a man who had died was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a considerable crowd from the town was with her. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, do not weep. Then he came up and he touched the bier, and the bearers stood still. And he said, young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized them all, and they glorified God, saying, a great prophet has arisen among us, and God has visited his people. And this report about him spread throughout the whole of Judea and all the surrounding country. Behold, this is the word of God. Amen. Let's thank him for it as uh, Walt comes forward. Thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you for telling us what you're going to do before you do it. Thank you for telling us while you're doing it and after you did it. At the end of the day, Lord, all we have is your revelation. And yet that is enough. Cause us now to believe it. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, everybody, for coming. I... Uh, maybe if you knew I was preaching, you wouldn't have come, but you did, and so I'm, I'm glad you're here. Uh, my name is Walt Hampton. I'm actually a teacher. This is my 31st year of teaching, if you can call this year teaching. Um, and so uh, I get to do that a lot, and I'm very comfortable with that, but doing this is a different thing, um, because I think a lot of you guys might actually be paying attention. And uh, so that's a kind of a responsibility. But also handling, handling the Word of God is different than just teaching somebody about music. I'm a music teacher. And, um, you know, where if, you, if I mess up something, I can just come back the next day and say, uh, you guys, I got that wrong. But anyway, so it's exciting. It's kind of... Uh, I don't want to say nervous, but it's definitely a different feeling, and it's, it's really fun to be here. All right. I was excited to look on our website and find that all these sermons that Dustin and Kevin preach have titles. And so I get to give my sermon a title, which is some... I don't think I've ever even given a talk that has a title. And um, <clears throat> so I give this sermon the title, Empty Hands. And it's because that's a little bit what it's about, but um, there's also a song I really like by someone you've never heard of, but one of the lines from the song is, uh, you know, you come with empty hands or you don't come at all. And um, that's a little bit what we're talking about today. <clears throat> so I'm sorry up front if I read, you know, if I'm not always making eye contact and stuff, I'm just a little new at this particular kind of delivery. Okay, so here's how I decided to break down our scripture for today. One, we would have a read-through, and that's what Kevin just did, and we do that all, every week. But then I would make 
a few just little remarks on things that jumped out at me um, from the passage, and then we would deal with a couple, you know, bigger themes. So, here we go. All I'm going to do right now in this first part is look at some things that you may not have thought about in the in our text. Okay, verse 7 to chapter 7, verse 2 of what we just did. And I've got my iPad here because I can actually see it. <laughs> If I was actually reading a Bible, I'd have to have my reading glasses on. And Okay, 7-2. Now a centurion had a servant who was sick at the point of death, who was highly valued by him. All right, what is a centurion? A centurion is a Roman battlefield commander, meaning he's one of the guys that's actually on the field fighting with the soldiers. He's not a higher up making orders and stuff. He's on the field. He was usually over 80 to 100 people, and uh, they respected him because he was one of them. He understood authority. He had people above him and people below him, and that comes up in this, this passage quite a bit. So that's what a centurion was. It's likely, well, possible, maybe likely, that uh, he was the um, commander of the garrison the Roman garrison there in Capernaum, because they say uh, he he built our synagogue for us. Well, I doubt that he actually put the synagogue together, but because of his position, he probably cleared the way for them to have a synagogue. And so, <clears throat> anyway, he may have been the commander of the Roman garrison there in Capernaum. All right, now I have a whole bunch of observations here, but I'm skipping a bunch of them because it would make this way too long and I find that I overplanned this. All right, so now I'm looking at verses 7 and 8. The centurion says, Therefore I did not presume to come to you, Jesus, but say the word and let my servant be healed. For I too am a man set under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes. And I say to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. All right, now, this is something I mentioned just a minute ago. He clearly understood authority. Um, The centurion was not confused by this situation because he lived it every day. Um, His orders came from above, and then he, using his authority, told the people below him to do certain things, and they did them. And he trusted the one above him. He kind of had to. I mean, he didn't... (laughs) In the Roman army, he didn't, it's not like he had a choice. He trusted the person above him. And his soldiers, because they knew his character, trusted him. And trust is a big word today. Anyway, so I just wanted to point out that he saw this happening all, all day, every day. He would receive orders. Have the soldiers do this and this and this. He would turn to his people. You guys, you, you, you do this. And so he was kind of the transfer station for what was going on. And so he looked at what Jesus was doing, and he said, that's exactly like what I'm doing, only it's with God. And because he had heard about Jesus, and Jesus' fame had preceded him, uh, he understood it. All right, apparently, and this is, I like this part, Apparently, Jesus never went to the house of the centurion. Did you notice that? They met him. He said, this is amazing faith. Servant is healed. And that was the end of it. Now, the reason I like that is because Jesus was not schmoozing the Roman authorities. You see what I mean? He wasn't going and saying, hey, I'm the guy who healed your servant. Um, We we need a little money. (laughs) Uh, He didn't schmooze anybody. And, and that's what I love about Jesus and his ministry here on earth. He was that most dangerous of creature to the authorities. He was a free agent. He didn't need what they had. He had his own authority. He knew what he was doing. He knew where he was going. And that's why every, well, the, the Jewish authorities and the Roman authorities perceived him as a threat because he didn't need them. Now, I don't know if any of you guys have ever been in that situation, Most of us don't get to do it. 
But when you, don't, when you no longer need what somebody has, you gain a whole lot of power. Uh, I'll give you a funny example. I didn't tell the last service this, but I, I knew a lady, not very well, who was retirement age, a teacher. Taught at a middle school, and it was not the most pleasant middle school. I spent some time there, and it was not that pleasant of a middle school. <laughs> it was a day in November. She was retirement age. She could retire anytime she wants. She came in. The kids were horrible. She took a lot of abuse. And then in like third period, I'm done. <laughs> she went to the office. Here's my keys. What? I'm retiring. <laughs> and so when the word about that went through, you know, the other teachers, it's like, wow, you're sticking it to the man, <laughs> you know. But that's the thing. They didn't have any, she could retire. They didn't, there's nothing they could hold over her. And so she said, I'm done. And uh, now I, I don't really admire that. I just thought it was funny. Um, and that is kind of the position Jesus was in. He didn't owe them anything. He didn't need anything of theirs. And so he healed the guy for his own reasons and moved on. And he probably never even met the centurion. Anyway, I thought that was kind of cool. Uh, verse 15, 14 or 15. Okay, the healing of the, the, the raising to life of the widow's son. Jesus came up and touched the bear and said to the bearers, the bear stood still and he said, young man, I say to you, okay, did you notice in this, the widow didn't say a thing. There was no statement of faith, which is like totally the opposite of what you just saw with the centurion. The widow didn't say a thing. The widow also was utterly powerless, right? She was a widow, which in that culture is not good. She had just lost her only son. I think it says that was her only son. And Jesus felt compassion for her. Um, and so he, he brought her son back to life. Now, these two things are important. I think it's kind of cool that they're next to each other, these two examples, because one was great faith. One was no faith displayed at all. One was a powerful person. One was utterly powerless. One was a Gentile. One was a Jew. These are just completely different things, and it illustrates why God does things. One thing, well, we'll get to that. When we get to our major topics, we'll get to why God does things. <clears throat> all right. In 716, it says, fear seized them all. Now, I just want to point out here that the word fear in Greek means fear. <laughs> well, I hear this soft pedaled a lot, like it means respect or uh, reverence or something like no when you're dealing with God it means fear and it should mean fear because that's God is God all right uh, when I'm dealing with Dustin I can say well fear actually means respect okay but I'm not actually afraid of Dustin all right but with God okay I'll give you an example the last time I felt real pit of my stomach fear, and I mean felt it, was about two years ago I was walking my dog in the middle of the night. We have this one dog that you have to walk in the middle of the night because he's a freak whenever he sees other dogs. And so I was out at, I don't know, 11 p.m. walking my dog. And as I looked up at the sky, I saw a shooting star. <clears throat> And it wasn't just a little shooting star. It went from over there to over there. And it took a few seconds. And as I watched that, this feeling in my stomach was like, okay, I'm really insignificant. Mm, I'm not as cool as I thought I was. <laughs> and that was the last time I experienced fear. Now, I mean real fear. Just for a few seconds, it was like, wow, God, that was something. And so here these people are, standing in the presence of someone who was dead and raised to life by this great prophet, which was probably a lot more intense than, than that star going across the sky. And so that was 
fear. And it's okay. Fear is an appropriate response when you begin to understand just a little of who God is. So <clears throat> I wouldn't worry about that. That's, that's normal. And uh, just to attach this, I couldn't resist because I love C.S. Lewis. You know, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, most of you have probably read that book, where these children end up in this magical land where this lion, Aslan, is the king. And um, they haven't met the lion yet. They've met Mr. and Mrs. Beaver. And, uh, and Lucy, I think it's Lucy, the littlest kid, says, he's a lion? Is, is it safe? Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Don't you hear what Mrs. Beaver tells you? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. Okay, and so that's kind of the way our fear works. No, he's not safe, but he's on your side. And um, he's good. So I just had to throw that in because I thought it was kind of funny. All right, now we're on to real major themes. The first major theme of two <laughs> is why do bad things happen? All right, obviously you see a lot of bad things that happened in this, in this piece of scripture. The widow's son died. That was very bad. Centurion's servant was dying. That was also bad. If you look through the Bible, you see all sorts of bad things. If you ever read the book of Job, it's just a giant bad thing. All right, until you know, until you get closer to the end. But countless other events in the Bible are bad. But I would like to qualify the word bad. When it's happening to us, when you're struggling with something that's this huge, it's bad. But what's really happening is it's something very difficult because you don't know that it's going to work out to be bad, really. In fact, these things we saw, well, in this passage, they didn't work out to be bad, but they were difficult. And so we kind of have to temper things when we use the word bad. Why do bad things happen? I used that word because I knew that everybody would identify it with bad things happening, but they're not always bad. All right. Countless other events in the Bible happen that are bad, but why do they happen? Well, let's, let's explore that. John 9... One through three. All right. As he passed by, Jesus, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? So the disciples were assuming that somebody did something wrong and that's why this guy was blind. And he was blind from birth. And Jesus answered, It was not that this man sinned, or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. All right, now I've read that, you know, hundreds of times, just sort of blow past it. But you have to stop and think, wow. Okay, so the point of that guy's life was to be born blind so that on this day when he was 40 years old or whatever, Jesus could come along and heal him. <laughs> that's pretty, that's something. That tells you why bad things happen. So that people can see the glory of God and so that God's plan can move forward. All right? Now, you might think that's horrible. That's just a brutal thing to do to this guy. But take it from the guy's perspective, the blind guy. He was born blind. Do you think he was grateful to be healed? I'm sure he was. Um, it may not have occurred to him to think, you made me blind for 40 years or whatever it was. So you could, it may not have occurred to him. But it gets better. I would bet that that man eventually, if not right then, placed his faith in Jesus for his salvation. 
And so now we're 2,000 years later from him being healed. How do you think he feels about that day now? (laughs) You think he's okay with that? I think he's okay with that. That was the day he was made to see, but it was also the day he learned about Jesus. He put his faith in Jesus, and now 2,000 years into heaven, he's got to be saying, you know, I'm totally good with the whole blind thing. I'm all right with that. Uh, It's all right. But it does show us something about why these things happen. And it really takes, you kind of have to take some perspective on it and uh, say, you know what, I think there's going to be a time when I look back on this and say, it's okay, God, you, you actually did know what you were doing. Uh, that's easy for me to say because I'm not struggling with some horrible thing. Okay, but, and I understand that. But uh, I think it's nice to have people around you who can say that. All right, <clears throat> let's look at Lazarus, John 11. One through four. I'm just, I'm just going to look a little bit of Lazarus' thing. Now, a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the uh, Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So Martha and Mary and Lazarus were siblings, and apparently they were all pretty good friends of Jesus. So the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now, if you read the whole thing, you find out that Jesus heard about Lazarus' illness, and he stayed where he was for two more days so that Lazarus would die. Seriously. So, (laughs) Lazarus died so that Jesus' power could be displayed and so that God's plan could move forward. All those people saw that. And this, uh, what does it say, Bethany is like two miles from Jerusalem. So you had a lot of of the Jewish high mucky mucks were, were in the loop for this. And they saw what happened. Now, they might, they might not have all placed their faith in who Jesus said he was, but they made a decision about it, which is what God was making them do. He was saying, look, my, this guy here, Jesus, is clearly the son of God. You got a choice to make. <laughs> and they did. You know, some of them believed in him, some of them didn't. Anyway, so Lazarus, the whole point of him dying was so that Jesus could be glorified, so that God could be glorified, and his plan moves forward. So, you get to the book of Job. You know the book of Job. He lost all his possessions. He lost his entire family, except a wife who told him to curse God and die. Uh, He had a few friends left, but they all blamed him for what was happening. So it's not like he was left with a lot of wonderful things in his life. Job was utterly miserable. And he questioned God. And he he just sort of, he was a righteous man. He couldn't understand why this was happening. He didn't believe his friends when they said, look, it's all your fault because you did this and this and this. Um, Anyway, finally at the end of the book, God God talks to Job and says, were you there when I created the world? Were you there when I created this animal or this or made this mystery happen? And Job Job listens to God and he has a great response, which is kind of like what I've just been saying. But here's what Job said. And I didn't put this I didn't put this up there because what I did is I took out a couple little interjections in there so you could just hear strictly what Job said. Job said, I know that you, God, can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. In other words, I should have kept my mouth shut and just looked. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, 
but now my eye sees you. Essentially, that's, I thought I understood, but I didn't. (laughs) But now, after all this, I do. So my response to that is, therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes, which is pretty much, I'm just going to sit here and shut up. (laughs) Uh, You're God. And so that's kind of the same thing. Job's suffering was for the glory of God and to move his plan forward. Uh, That's what God does, thankfully. If we moved our plans forward or worked strictly for our glory, then that would probably be a mess. But we have to understand, in a human, like when you see a megalomaniac who it's all about him or her and their plans and their glory, we think that's, well, we should think that's inappropriate. That's not right. You're just a human. I'm a human. You're just a human. (laughs) And you shouldn't be that way. But with God, like I said, things are different. He's holy. He's utterly different. And so the same things that apply to us, what looks like egotism or self-centeredness in us, is only appropriate in God. Uh, who else should be the object of, of praise in this universe? I mean, the obvious answer, if you line up all the people and God, the obvious answer is going to be, well, okay, him. Okay? So, that thing, things change when you're talking about God. The definition of words changes when you're talking about God. Love, human love is one thing. God's love is another thing. Compassion, human compassion is one thing. God's compassion raises a widow's son from the dead. All right? Um, Fear, like I already talked about. Faith, trust, all those words take on a different meaning when you're talking about God. And that's part of him, a little, little bit of him being holy. When he says, I'm holy, a little bit of what he's saying is, look, you can't use human measures on me. It doesn't work. You can't even use the measures you were using for your little pagan gods on me. Anyway, even the fall of mankind and the curse of the earth will work out to God's greater glory. Now, that's bigger than the centurion or the widow or the book of Job. That's this whole hot mess that we are living in. Someday it's all going to be sorted out and it will result in more glory for God than if it had never happened. That, that takes a minute to process because everybody thinks, man, if Adam and Eve just hadn't sinned, then... <laughs> But that sin is going to work out for more glory for God. So we got that going for us, which is kind of kind of cool. Anyway, fortunately, we we are part of his plan, and we get to kind of ride along in his wake, you know, as he does this stuff, as he works out his plan, as he glorifies himself. We're kind of trailing along in the bubbles behind him soaking up some of that, well, I suppose in a way soaking up some of that glory, but certainly reveling in the plan that he is unfolding. All right. So now we go on to major theme number two, and that is, what is faith? This is a big question because all my life, and maybe all of your Christian life, there's been this question, because you see verses about faith in the Bible and And you think, okay, well, I've got to have faith and I've got to do this and this and this. And the word faith has been damaged through overuse and abuse. TV preachers, uh, various other leaders. Usually faith, and I'm not saying in this church or in a lot of churches, but usually the word faith is just slanted the wrong direction. It's misappropriated. They've made it so that faith seems to be a power that you have in yourself. All right? Something you unleash 
to create your best life now. <laughs> okay, that's the title of a book by, by the nameless prosperity preacher. Um, I don't know if you know this, but there is now your best life now for moms. There is also a your best life now board game. So you're going to run out and get that. Uh, <laughs> a board game. Okay. Releasing a power inside of you to manipulate God or get what you want is not what faith is. Um, so today, what I thought I would do is I would make use of a synonym. I'm going to substitute the word trust. Okay. And if you look up, you know, these Greek words, I actually looked at some Greek words. Dustin, you would have been proud of me. Uh, in fact, there was one Greek word, they had the word, and then there was something that looked like an A before it. And I thought, is that like, you know, apolitical or whatever? Does it mean not? I think it does, right? Are we really doing this right now? Yeah. <laughs> I, well, does that A mean A? Anyway, I was looking at Greek words. <laughs> okay, anyway, so the Greek word translated faith is also trust, belief. It gives you some synonyms that you can kind of use. Um, the word trust I like because it tends to direct your faith towards someone or something else. And it tends to imply a specific situation. For example... I trust my car to make it over the pass. Okay, I'm, I'm trusting something, and I'm trusting it to do something. I trust my guitar to stay in tune for a whole set of, of worship songs. Okay, I'm trusting something, and I'm trusting it to do something. And um, <clears throat> so that's kind of why I like the word trust, is you have to attach more things to it but one thing you're not doing, and this is probably the key, is you're not trusting your ability to trust. Now you guys are saying, well, of course not. Well, do you realize that's what faith preachers are telling you to do? Put faith in your ability to have faith? Okay. Now we would never say, I, I trust my ability to trust, therefore my car is going to make it over the path. No, no. We know about our car and if we trust it to get over the pass. Well, that's kind of the key with God. You have to know something about God from the Bible, from the things around you. Anyway, so I like the word trust. Faith, then, is simply to trust in God, His words, His character, and His ability. So, in order for someone to have faith, trust in God, they need to know something about God. Just like you know about, you know, your car, your guitar. Which brings us to a couple passages. All right, Romans 10, 13 to 15. Romans 10, 13 to 15. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how will they preach unless they are sent Etc. What he's saying there is, look, in order for people to place their faith, their trust in God, they have to know something about God. And so we, Paul, we are going out, we're telling them about God so that they have something they can put their, they know about God and they can put their trust in. God has said this, God has said this, God has said this. Because I See who God is. I trust him to do those things. That's what faith is. But you have to know a little something in order to put your faith in it. 
Um, let's do, the, oh, by the way, as long as I'm here, let's back up, and, and Mike, you don't have this, back up to verse 11. I'll just read it to you. This is Romans 10, 11, and 12. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing riches on all who call on him. Now, as long as I was here, just in this scripture, I wanted to say there's been a lot said of uh, racism and stuff like that. And I, you know, I don't, I don't know. There may be churches or organizations, whatever. People's racism, I'm not saying to know about that. What I am saying is that it's not here in the Bible, okay? It is perfectly plain in the Bible that God's salvation, God's grace is extended to everyone without any distinction. And, and that's what they just said. He named the two major racial groups, cultural groups, racial groups in their area. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. When he was there, that was everybody. You were a Jew or a Greek. All right? So I just wanted to clear that up. If you've got a problem with racism in the church, your problem is not with God. Your problem might be with people in the church or uh, something like that, but it's not with God. All right, <clears throat> we're going to go to Hebrews chapter 11 now. That is, and that's not going to appear on the Sky Bible, I don't think, because I'm just going to read you some stuff. Uh, Hebrews chapter 11 is kind of the heroes of the faith chapter. All right? And it always uses the phrase, by faith. By faith, this person did this. Or by faith, we do this. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a different phrase in there just to get us to think about it from a different angle. Because we are exploring the question of what is faith. All right. I'm going to insert the phrase, instead of by faith, I'm going to use the phrase, because he or she trusted God. Okay? Let's see what that gives us. Verse 3 of Hebrews chapter 11. Because we trust God, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God. Okay, now before it said, by faith we understand, and that's true. But because we trust God, we understand that the universe was made, created by the word of God. Hmm. Verse 4, because he trusted God... Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain. Verse 5, because he trusted God, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. Hmm. Verse 7, because he trusted God, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear constructed an ark. Now that's a really good one because we all know about Noah. Because he trusted God, he built the ark. Now you're saying, well, I would too. There was a flood coming. You realize rain had never fallen. <laughs> and God said, hey, Noah, this water is going to fall from the sky. Not only that, but it's going to explode from the earth. And this whole thing is going to be underwater. So for the next 120 years, I want you to build a giant boat. That is an unusual request. And, <laughs> and Noah, because he trusted God, did it. That was a supreme act of faith. Because he saw God was worthy of his trust. And he said, you know, if you say that water is going to fall from the sky... I'll believe you. And he, start, and he put action to his belief and started building that boat. He got his sons to help him. And I, I'm sure they were like, what? What are you talking about? <laughs> I, I got other stuff to do. Anyway, <laughs> 120 years of building that giant boat. Anyway, and there are a whole bunch of things in there where it says by faith. And it's kind of interesting 
um, to substitute because he or she trusted God. Uh, I'll give you one more. This was Sarah. Because she trusted God, Sarah herself received the power to conceive even when she was past age. Since she considered him faithful, worthy of trust, who had promised. All these died trusting God, not having realized, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on this earth. Now, wow. Does that honor God? Trusting him even though you don't get the prize at the bottom of the cereal box. You see what I mean? They trusted him for these things he had promised, and they never even saw, they never got to see the fulfillment of them. But it was such a cool demonstration of faith on their part that they just trusted God. Anyway, notice that all these people, and this is back to what is faith, notice that all these people were responding to God. He said them something. He showed them something. Um, and they trusted him because they knew something of him. Like the centurion. The centurion didn't know much, but he had heard about this prophet and he understood how authority worked. And if this prophet was really in touch with God, then he could heal my servant. And he did. You say, but God hasn't told me anything. Dude, that's what the Bible's for. He's told you everything you need to know. And uh, so that's where you're going to find the things that you put your trust in, you put your faith in. But this brings the question, what about people who don't read the Bible? Are they totally exempt from having to show any trust or any reverence or any, I don't know, acknowledgement of God? How can they have faith? Well, I'm glad you asked, because we are going back to Romans. Romans 1, 19 to 21. And this is interesting. I really like this passage, this whole Romans 1 thing. 19 through 21. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power, the fact that he's eternal, and his divine nature, the fact that he's God, have been clearly perceived even since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they, these people out there, are without excuse. Okay? What's that saying is, okay, you don't know the gospel. There are a lot of things you don't know. But just by opening your eyes and looking around, out the window, there's enough there to tell you there's a God there. He's eternal. And he's powerful. And I owe him something. Because I'm not God. And so that is a response of faith. That is a response of of trust. Now, does that mean that you don't send out missionaries? No, because missionaries have the real good news. They have the answer to the question that person is asking. All right? But there's still enough out there for someone who is wanting to acknowledge God, to acknowledge God, to see his attributes and what he's like, to honor him and thank him. And the faith, faith develops from there. And God fills in the blanks. He'll bring people into their life that'll give them more about him, more to trust. Okay, just from what we've seen, I think we can say fairly well what faith is. And I'm not going to say this is a definition of faith. I mean, it was hard for me to arrive at a definition of faith, and I think somebody else could probably fill in more of the blanks here. But here's what we know. It involves God saying or showing you something and you trusting what he's said because of who he is. Okay? Again, it's not a power inside of you. It's not you believing for a new Cadillac. All right? 
Now, maybe if God really said, I'm going to give you a new Cadillac, <laughs> you could trust that. But even then, the things you can actually trust are in the Bible. I'd be a little uh, skeptical of a promise of a new Cadillac or a new jet for your ministry. All right? <clears throat> Anyway, so God has shown you or told you something. And because you know what he's like, you trust him. That is what faith is. Now, we've talked about healing a centurion's uh, slave. We've talked about the widow's son coming back to life and being healed by Jesus. And that was God's plan. And one of them was really a demonstration of faith. But faith for us... It's not usually about bringing a dead son back to life or our servant being <laughs> saved. Faith for us is about how do we spend eternity with God. That's our main faith connection with God. So here we go. <clears throat> I'm going to throw out a few verses about faith and the gospel, the good news. Of salvation. One is John 11. Seventeen. Now this is more of the Lazarus story. When Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus is like, no, 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 no. that's not what I'm talking about. <clears throat> Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Now, you guys, that is something that God has said. That's that thing I was talking about. He said this. You can grab onto that. And you can say, God, you said this. And because I know kind of what you're like, I can trust that. He just told you, if you believe in him, you're never going to die. Okay? So what I'm doing here is I'm throwing out some things that God has said that you attach your trust, your faith, to. Let's try Romans 10.9. <laughs> okay. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. All right? You can't get a whole lot more straightforward than that. Okay, that's another thing that God has thrown out there. Attach your faith to this. I said it. Look at my character. I back up what I say. That's why you can trust this. All right? <clears throat> Second Corinthians 5.21. Mm. Okay, for our sake, God made him, Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. What he's talking about here is the fact that you get to switch places with Jesus. All those sins that you've committed got put on him, so that all the righteousness that he committed gets put on you. All right, that's another salvation thing that you can put your trust in because God said it. Uh, several years ago, I was with a band 
that used to preach and play music in prisons. And it was always really, I loved playing in prisons because there was no pretense there. There was nobody saying, yeah, I guess I'm the spiritual guy around here. They were all there for a very good reason. And um, anyway, <clears throat> I used to tell them this. This is a kind of a crude analogy, but they understood it. So you get to, you get to the gates of heaven. You've just died. And St. Peter, now I know it doesn't work this way, just stop. You guys are like, wait, how do you know St. Peter's at the gates of heaven checking people in? Like, I'm not, okay. So St. <laughs> Peter pulls out your file and he says, okay, I've got sins on you going back to when you were 11 years old or maybe before and it's not pretty. And uh, you, God is holy, you can't come in here with that. File cabinet, file folder. But when you place your trust in the sacrifice that Jesus made, what happens is God takes your file folder out of that cabinet and puts it in Jesus' cabinet. And he takes Jesus' file folder and puts it in your cabinet. So when you get there, he says, wow, looks like you were pretty amazing. You're exactly the kind of person that belongs here. Because you were, uh, you look an awful lot like my son. It's like you've been covered in him. Okay? That's what I used to tell the prisoners, prisoners, inmates. But they had, the name for those people changed every couple of years. <laughs> uh, offenders was one, and I think they made one that was less offensive than offenders. But anyway, um, you get to switch folders. You get to have the righteousness of Christ. And he already took your sins. And it's through faith. Through, through saying, Jesus, I believe you died, rose again, and took my sin on you. Anyway, so at this point, what I would do is I would have a really clever and pithy statement to tie everything together and make you all say, ah, yeah, but I, I don't. Uh, that's just kind of the end of the sermon. And uh, I'm, really, I'm really glad to be able to sh share the word of God. I appreciate that there's no pithy statement, that there's no punchline. It's just the word of God. And so anyway... There we go, and now Dustin is back, and Kevin, and thank you.